Hello, everybody, and welcome to not only the Angry Sun Zone, but the month of October. We got Spook- a pod- Spooktober. Yeah, that's right. We got a podcast for you. Alex, what's your favorite word that starts with the letter O? O. Hmm. Orangutan. Orangutan is a good one. Sean, what's your favorite word that ends in the letter R? <laughs> Sorry, my mind went to a very not podcast friendly place there for a minute. <laughs> Hey, our podcast's rated mature, right? <laughs> yeah, I said, I said to explicit, so... <laughs> uh, okay, um... Because I know I'm just going to swear a bunch and I don't want to have a filter. <laughs> to be fair, coming up with a word that ends in a letter is way harder. Because we yeah. don't to think like that. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm like... trying to think of a specific word here. And, and I can conceptually think of the word, but trying to form the word in my mind right now is... Hold on. That doesn't. You really want to mess with someone. Ask them to come up with a word that has a specific syllable in the middle of the word. Oh, I got a very unique word. Okay. Razor. All like right. that phone that got released. Pretty sure when we were in high school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, that was... That was, uh... When Mo- one of my favorite phones ever. I remember getting it, and it felt like... It felt like I had, like, you know... The, the ultimate gadget in my hand for a little while. <laughs> when, Mo- when Motorola meant something. And I'm Sato. I, my name doesn't start with an O or end with an R. That would make it Osantor. Osantor? <laughs> we start this episode with wordplay. But we're not playing words on this podcast. We're playing games. And let's get into uh, some games. Personally, I finished up AI the Somnium Files, and it's it's the best game I've played this year, for sure, and it's probably the best game I've played for a few years. I loved this game from start to finish. It super held up, because that's something that is difficult for any kind of mystery game, is that... And, I tr- and this is something that I try to do when I'm playing it. I try to not think too much about it. Because I don't want to be, like, thinking, oh, what's the twist going to be? Because there's going to be a twist. Yeah. So I try to put myself in that frame of mind where I'm not trying to guess it, where I'm letting the game take me for a ride. And this game, like, did that flawlessly throughout. Like, I was... I was not dissatisfied with any of the twists and turns. Not once did I think, oh, that's fucking stupid, or oh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it really, really stuck the landing. And it's it's a curious thing, because the game has a bra- the game has branching paths, so the information that you're getting at different ta- times will vary between, you know, people who are playing the game. Like, I went on a route where I just ended up choosing, like, the A path through it. I'm pretty sure I got, like, the expected first path, actually, based on some of the information that I found. So, I think if I went, like, the other way at the beginning, I might not have actually liked it that much, because there's questions asked in the first... in on the route that I went, that like, paint certain characters in a certain way, and they're almost, like, shown to be the opposite on the other route. It's interesting. It's a really interesting structure for the game. All the characters, like, still really endearing till the end. The... who the villain ended up being was also a complete, like, twist. That was super awesome. Uh... There's a a few sections later on in the game that just get batshit crazy. One of the um, Somniums, which is the dream states that you go into, is patterned after a certain other extremely popular game. <laughs> oh. And uh, I don't even want to say it. I don't want to say <laughs> it because it's so good. It was such an amazing surprise. I I, I want I I on our Twitter account at Angry Sun Zone I put up a thread that just had a bunch of, like, fun uh, screenshots uh, from my playthrough of the game, and I actually 
I probably should delete that one if that shows that world, because as hilarious as it is, like, people listening, you should play this game. It might still be on sale for like 20 bucks Canadian. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's super duper good. One thing that I thought was quite funny and uh, very obvious from the Twitter thread uh, that we've, uh, that Santa put up there, uh, this game is extremely horny. Like, I I, I mentioned this <laughs> at, at such last episode that the main... It's it's just the main character who's super horny. I, it's so horny. I I swear I, the, there are lit, there are games with literal explicit like pornographic scenes that are less horny <laughs> than this game. I swear. Well, it's all about the desire. It's all about the want, and he never gets it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're worried about this game being problematic, don't worry. Um, everybody else treats the main character. With disdain for being a pervert whenever he gets a bit frisky. And he's... It's all in his mind. Unfortunately, his mind is being read by his AI companion in his left eyeball. So... So you get to know his inner thoughts. No matter how uh, good or bad they may be. Yeah, and I, the dialogue, again, just like... Solid throughout. Uh, there's a ton of amazing pop culture references that were just hilarious to see come up. Uh, so now that, that so now that's actually interesting that you mentioned that because uh, I, I'm in, I'm interested. Do you think that that's a case where the pop cultural references were adapted to like North American culture or? Uh, yeah, that's something that I'm extremely curious about because I mean there there's a number of pop culture references that are J- Japanese pop culture references, and some of them are ones that do cross over, like there's, you know, a couple Dragon Ball references. Yeah. Like, that's something that crosses over. It, that that plays not the language. But because there's so many pun- puns and wordplay in this game, I'm really curious, um, like, how, how much of that was uh, localized and not. Because one, one thing that I've definitely learned from consuming Japanese media is that they love their wordplay. And certainly in, I, I've, I've, I've watched some anime with translator's notes that take up like half of the goddamn screen because to, yeah. ex- to explain a dumb pun that only makes sense in Japanese. So yeah, lo- localization is a really interesting thing that I, 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 I should probably look up some interviews with some people about that because the writing in this game, like. I found it super hilarious and super on point with those pop culture references and wordplay, but who knows, the original Japanese could have been extremely way more serious or something like that. I don't know, but probably not. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's uh, AI the Somnium Files. Again, super high recommend from me. Uh, yeah, I believe actually, uh, I think I read there, there was a sequel there was being yes. worked on as well. There is a sequel that should be coming out next year, and I am extremely excited for that. Now to go on to the next long-ass named game on my list. It's probably going to be Vesteria Saga 1 War of the Scions. <laughs> There's no Vesteria Saga 2. Yet. Exactly. <laughs> so, look forward to that. I suppose. For the people who know what that game is, you probably know why I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll keep the rest of you in all in suspense about that. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like a fun game. I'm, uh, I, I probably don't have time to play it, but... <laughs> you need to... If you're going to play any kind of, like, visual novel slash mystery thing, you got to finish Phoenix Wright first. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, finish all the Phoenix Wright games. Yeah. Uh... Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna just talk about what I've been playing recently, which is uh, mostly being a game uh, called For the King. Uh, this is, uh, it's a few years old now, but it's had a few expansions uh, over that time, I believe. And essentially, it's kind of like a roguelike RPG. And when I say RPG, I'm... It's it's definitely more of a classic JRPG style RPG, um, like turn based combat. Yeah, tur- oh, yeah, like like turn based combat. Now you have my attention. <laughs> very like very traditional turn based combat. There's no 
there's no quick time events there's no uh like action items stuff like that like it's all just like choices it's decisions about what attacks you want to make right uh so the battle system's very like you know kind of like an old school battle system and i'd say that uh, the only thing about it that's kind of interesting uh, and a bit different than like a really old school RPG is that uh, the turn the turn order is actually uh, a bit dynamic because the turn order is uh, depends on uh, the speed stat of characters. Okay. And that and your speed stat can actually change in battle depending on uh, status effects. Right. Okay. Uh, and then of course you know your speed can, your speed stat can change based on. Uh, the items you carry. Uh, your stats don't really change much when you level up in terms of your core. Uh, well, your hit, your health goes up, uh, but your, you know, power, intelligence, stuff like that doesn't change when you level up. So, uh, yeah, so a very traditional, a uh, fairly traditional combat system, I'd say, uh, with a few cool touches based on status effects and special moves. Uh, and then the interesting thing about it though is that i would say that it is a rpg that is from the ground up really designed uh to work well as a cooperative game okay and uh the party is made up of actually three characters uh as opposed to maybe a more uh standard four but uh it doesn't really matter uh, you know it's kind of arbitrary uh after all does but that mean you can have three player co op. You can have three player co op. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So you can have uh, up to three player co op. Uh, you can do two player co op where one person controls two characters, or you can just you can play on your own and just control all three characters as well. So uh, one of the other differences from a lot of other P RPGs is how the overworld works. So the overworld is a hex based grid. And your each party member actually moves independently on the overworld. Huh. And so there's actually turns on the overworld, and uh, you uh, roll uh, to move, to do moves. Now, something I'll explain about this game that I actually really like uh, that is a bit different is that a lot of act, pretty much all of the actions in the game uh, re revolve around rolls. Now. It's meant to simulate, uh, like, how dice rolls work, in a sense. And uh, you have multiple rolls, as if you were rolling multiple dice, and the percent chance that you beat those rolls is based on your stats. So most of your stats vary between about 50 to up to 95. The only way to get to 95 is with items, though. Uh, but... Most cl every class has a different mixture of stats, right? So if you're the scholar class, that's kind of like the wizard, and he has high. In uh, the wizard has uh, the scholar has high intelligence, and so you know it starts at like around eighty ish. Uh, the the primary stat for most classes is around eighty, and that means that if you have a staff, your let's say your staff does six damage, and your staff when it attacks has three rolls. That means that your your intelligence stat is going to be essentially tested three times to get the maximum of six damage. And if you get only two successes out of the three, you're only going to do four damage. You'll get you get one ex, one success, you'll do two damage. And if you get all three successes, you do the maximum six damage. And then also some weapons have special abilities when you get a perfect roll. And how hard, how difficult the perfect roll is essentially depends on how many rolls there are. So you might have a weapon that does tons of damage and has a cool effect, uh, like causing a status effect, like, say, setting the enemy on fire, uh, but it takes five rolls, you know, and it does lots of damage and sets them on fire, but getting all five perfect rolls is going to require uh, a very high uh, intelligence stat and a bit of an element of chance. And so all combat rolls have this element of chance where you have to pass the rolls to do anything at all. And then a lot of overworld events are essentially challenges that are based on your stats. 
you know, you might have a falling, you might randomly have an event that like a tree's falling on you and, you know, you get an agility test that either you jump out of the way and don't take damage or you fail the agility test. The tree hits you for like 15 damage, right? Uh, which is a lot early in the game. That could be half your health. <laughs> so it's, I like it. It's, it's pretty cool. And then um, there's, so there's enemies on the overworld that you can run into. And that's how uh, uh, that you can see that you can go fight or ambush. You know, sometimes you get ambushed on the overworld by enemies that you haven't seen yet. Uh, and then there's also dungeons. And the dungeons are essentially a series of rooms which contain battles or special events or sometimes a shop. A lot of the larger dungeons have a shop in them somewhere. And a lot of dungeons also, also have a boss at the end. Especially all the main quest dungeons always have a boss at the end. So it's very much like I, I like it a lot because it's very much I I like the mechanics. I think the mechanics are it's pretty much traditional RPG mechanics with a couple of interesting, you know, elements of chance, uh with an intuitive with a relatively intuitive interface for representing it that I, I like a lot. And uh one thing that I don't like about a lot of RPGs is that for co-op specifically, is that the co-op often feels a bit tacked on. Uh, whereas I f in this one, I really like, the, especially with the way the overworld works and the party mechanics work, uh, it feels like the game was designed with co-op in mind from the ground up. Now, the downsides of the game, the story is really kind of an excuse to send your characters all over the overworld. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't have much of a story to begin with. It, it, it's roguelike in the sense that it's supposed to be difficult and you're probably going to die several times before actually beating it. And when you die, that's it. There's no save. But it saves every turn, but it it deletes your save, right? Ah, okay. I'm sure there's a way to save Scummit if you were really interested in that, but it's kind of against the spirit of the game. And then also, much like many other roguelikes, you can unlock new weapons to find in your quests, and you can unlock new encounters that you can encounter. Uh, you can unlock uh, you can unlock outfits to customize the look of your character. Although most of the outfits actually get replaced once you put on items. So if you unlock a ninja outfit, you know as soon as you find new armor and new pants, your ninja outfit's gone, and you're just wearing whatever your armor is. Aww. Although some of some of the items are actually uh, pretty funny, uh, there's a unicorn hat, there's a princess hat. Those are both unlockable extra items. Oh, interesting. Um, there's like the fuzzy like clown collar kind of thing, <laughs> which gives you a fairly large gold multiplier. It gives you well, it gives you a reasonably large uh, gold multiplier and extra uh, evasion. Even though I, I have no idea why that would give you evasion. It makes no sense, but <laughs> uh, but it's fun. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's a cool little cool little uh, cooperative RPG, turn-based RPG, basically. Uh, I really like I, I really like it. Um, most of the downsides to it, like the fact that it's got pretty much no story to speak of, uh, other than just some excuses to send you on fetch quests and various dungeons yeah uh that oh, doesn't really crazy. matter for a co-op game to me that much yeah like the fact that it's a co-op game that puts a less of an emphasis on the story and it's also a roguelike which yeah. puts less of the emphasis on the story as well so that's not surprising <laughs> yeah and uh every time you start a new campaign it does randomize the world map so Although the biomes of the various areas you go to have the same kind of aesthetics, uh, you know, there's like a, you start in like a normal forest, there's a burning forest, there's a poisonous bog, you know, there's an ice biome, stuff like that. And there's ocean as well. And you, you can buy boats and go around. The game has an airship. That it has to. It's an RPG, right? <laughs> yeah. But unfortunately, I have not actually gotten to the airship yet kept dying before unlocking the airship. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I like it a lot so far and it's it's a lot of it's a lot of fun, you know? 
and for the most part, I like the way it handles the items too. Uh, it's got a pretty, it's got a pretty minimal uh, inventory. You know, you you your character has a hat, armor, you know, greaves or pants, and boots, and an amulet, and uh, one other accessory slot, uh, which is like your your ring slot, I think, actually. And so, using those items, you customize kind of you. you you customize your character a little bit in terms of how they look and then also how they play. And uh, a lot of your abilities come down to just what items you have equipped as well. So uh, there's lots of potential abilities in terms of different attacks, you know, different support moves. You, you can increase your evasion. You can increase your magic, uh, like intelligence for magic attacks. You can increase your strength for strength attacks. You can increase your vitality for like health and stuff. I'm not sure if it affects your health, actually, uh, but there's a lot of different way. There's a lot of different things you can do with your character. A lot of that's going to depend on what your class is as well. So, how does it handle that? Because it's you said you know you're rolling around to move around the environment and stuff. So it's clearly turn it's turn based. Yeah, and it's also a co op game. So can you, for example, modify your character while other people are taking their turns? Uh, no. Ah, uh, um, Well, okay, kind of. Uh, yes, it's a difficult problem to solve. Yeah, so the, the one of the things that you can do with the inventory management is that on any player's turn, you can actually, uh, just using the triggers, you can scroll between the different uh, party members' inventories. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually modify the, uh, in the you can make inventory decisions uh, for the other players while it's your turn. Right. Which, if you were... Uh, I could definitely see it being a bit, in certain groups, uh, controversial, because uh, you can kind of just make stupid decisions. <laughs> um, you and like your, take Yeah, your, you, your you can definitely rights. troll some other people and like take their items and stuff like that. Oh, man. Because uh, you can trade items and you can trade gold, uh, although you have to be within one square of your party members to do so. Mm -hmm. And that's something else I was wondering. So, because the party members are moving independently, when you get into a fight, is it only like people that are X amount nearby? Or... Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when you when you trigger fights, uh, if you're fighting an enemy on the overworld, only enemies within a certain number of spaces, or sorry, only party members within a certain number of spaces are going to be in that fight. Okay. Additionally, if there is an overworld enemy. Potentially, other overworld enemies that are nearby will join that enemy to fight against you. That's actually, I mentioned ambushing. So you can fight, or you can ambush, or you can attempt to sneak past an enemy, or you can retreat, uh, which just st uh, stops combat. If you ambush an enemy, the enemy is isolated. But to ambush an enemy, you need to uh, pass a series of awareness rolls, I believe. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, if your character has bad awareness, you're never going to be able to ambush anything very <laughs> easily at all. Uh, now, one other thing I didn't mention is that the game also has a mechanic called Focus. And what Focus does is that it's essentially a limited pool of perfect roles that you can call upon. Uh. So your character, most characters start with four Focus. And it's uh, for most characters, it's actually pretty hard to come by Focus. Uh, you gain two Focus when you level up. Uh, and then you can replenish focus uh, in towns by spending money to sleep or meditate. And if you don't have abilities which let you get focus back, it can be actually really hard to get focus. Hmm. And uh, focus is really important because it's essentially a uh, tactical resource you have to uh, essentially, like when you need an enemy to die, you know, you probably, uh, or else you'll die instead. You're probably going to try and focus your uh, combat roles. Yeah, uh, that's that's really interesting. That's, I think that's a really good addition um, to something like a, a roguelike specifically, like because roguelikes, you know, they tend to take control away from the player in terms of what they're going to find and stuff because they're all random. So giving the player control over some of that randomness, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, the focus mechanic's actually really cool because it, it really brings it really brings an element of like pushing your luck into almost every interaction that the game has. <laughs> uh, 
and and depending on your class, it uh, it really changes up the dynamics. Uh, when I was playing as the scholar, it was really fun because the scholar's passive ability is that he regen he has a chance to regenerate one focus at the end of his turn every turn, and that means that uh, the scholar is a really strong character for basically eliminating randomness and just bringing a reliable uh, damage output as well as a reliable ability to pass overworld checks into uh, your party. So that's that's kind of cool. And then there's, you know, other, you know, uh, there's like a minstrel class that has a, some, some support buffs to make combat rolls uh, get re-rolls when they fail. And there's um, he also like lets the other party members get extra experience and he has a gold multiplier. Uh, there's a character that can find herbs randomly at the end of turn, which have like healing effects or they boost focus or they boost your movement. Um, so that's, that's like free items, uh, essentially. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of cool different, a lot of cool different abilities that they brought into it. I've done, yeah, because I've done a few runs now, and each run definitely has played a bit differently, you know, depending on your class and depending on what items show up. So, yeah. How many classes are there? Uh, I think you start with four classes unlocked, and then there's like another, t uh, maybe another ten to unlock. So if you oh, think wow. about okay. that, you know, there, there's a good, there's a good, like... That's a lot of variety, though. There's a good dozen, there's a good, like, dozen or so classes in the game. And uh, if you think about it, there's only three in any party. So uh, just on class composition alone, there's quite a bit of variety. Uh, and then of the core stats, you know, you have strength, vitality, intelligence, awareness, uh, talent, luck, and maybe another one. I can't remember. But, uh, you know, you got like six core stats and pretty much every core stat, there is a class that specializes. There's at least one class that specializes in that stat. And every weapon, it's the roles that weapons have are all based on only one stat. So there's a lot of variety in the weapons, too. And, you know, you might get good weapons that don't work for your class, which is actually... Of course. Um, and then you got to make decisions like, oh, do I use this better weapon that I'm not good at using? Or do I use a weapon I'm worse at using, but I'm more reliable to hit with it? So a lot, a lot of decisions. It's really like, it's definitely an RPG where like the, the loadout, like making choices with your kit is probably where most of the game actually happens as opposed to in battles, right? Mm -hmm. Like the battles are not necessarily the most tactical but you know how good you're going to do in battles is really a lot more dependent on how you've decided to outfit your character so it's a bit more of a tactical and strategic focus as opposed to just like on the battles themselves like the battles themselves can be a bit more dynamic uh depending on what classes you've picked and what sorts of weapons you have because there are like like the evasion up abilities if you have an, a, a, a weapon that has a support ability to in, to increase evasion on your whole party it gives you like an extra 30 percent chance to evade hits on every member of your party which is massive um, and so a, a weapon that has that is extremely powerful and can be a bit add a bit more dy uh, you know dynamism to your battles but you might not always find things like that so it's a uh, it's it's a cool roguelike RPG. I, I like it a lot. It's uh, a really fun co-op RPG as well, and it has both local and online co-op. Well, if I was uh, sitting in front of the store and uh, and your comments, your commentary was a review, I would uh, definitely get that game. And uh, yeah, if you're down for some co-op action uh, sometime in the future, let's let's do it. Yeah, I. Uh... We might all have it because it was free on Epic Store for a little while. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we might end up uh, playing it sometime. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. You know, one of the things I didn't mention about For the King is that it's very... Uh, it, it also has a low-poly aesthetic. Um, it, it almost... Uh, you know, the characters have that sort of low-poly look, almost like one of those VR chat characters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Lord. That's a terrible... It's, it's, it's pretty far-fetched. It's listen, 
the creator of the Segway died on a Segway, so... <laughs> Wait, really? Yes. Oh my god, that's incredible. <laughs> For real? I think he fell off a cliff. Really? I forget. Uh, the Segway's going off a cliff as we segue into VR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. so we all have, you know, different experience levels with VR. Uh, Sean, you've, you've played a fair amount, right? Yeah. I uh, got quite a few apps and games downloaded to my uh, Oculus library. I have the Oculus Quest, the OG Oculus Quest, not the second one. Um, And uh, since it's October, or perhaps Spooktober in the room, what I would like to uh, do is talk about a specific VR game. This game I can describe in two words. Immersive horror. Okay. That is uh, that is the core essence of Dread Halls. And uh, one of the best ways to describe it is uh, at the very uh, tail end of their description on the store. Dread Halls is an intense and scary experience. Not for the faint of heart. You have been warned. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, with... Dread halls. Basically, you're you're trapped deep inside this endless sprawling dungeon. It's massive, and you have to find a way to escape. There there is a way to escape the dungeon, uh, but uh, before you can escape it, you uh, have to explore it uh, because every time that you die, you wake up um, somewhere else in this infinite dungeon. That's uh, that's that's the second step, but then. The, the very first step is you actually have to survive it because this dungeon is actively hostile to you and is trying to make you poop your pants. Okay, so just just for my clarification, is this like one dungeon that you spawn in random places or is it a different dungeon every time? <sighs> That's the player's choice, I think. What? They have two options. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so it's it's like a roguelike, but you can... Uh, you it's roguelike-like. Like. Yeah, roguelike. -like. It's like a roguelike, but it basically has almost like a story mode. So okay, yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, my experience with this game was it. It was indeed very intense uh, because, and I think it's best. Um, even though I'm a person who is addicted to spoilers, <laughs> I still uh, I actually went into this game blind, and so I didn't know what I was getting into. And I think with a horror game that's really the best way to experience it. Yeah. I agree, Alex. It really is. So, getting into this game, I went in blind and the dungeon is actively trying to kill you. Uh Is there any dungeon that isn't in the most horrifying ways possible? For example, one of my favorites is actually the gargoyle. And uh let me tell you in a dungeon where Nothing is what it seems. Uh, you even have reason to doubt the statues in a room. And uh, now, one one of the most important things in this dungeon uh, game is that it is pitch black when the lights are out, and so you're walking around with a torch. And there are times you might want to put away your torch because uh, you only have you know two hands, and so you can only grab two things at once, and uh, so. One of the most interesting things is that this torch requires oil, mm -hmm. and oil is a limited resource. And so if uh, you aren't actively looking for oil, you will eventually run out of oil, and then you will experience this game pit bumping around a, a completely pitch black uh -huh. dungeon. <laughs> so the, the, I want zero part of this game. <laughs> the, dar the darkness is constantly chasing you. Okay, so actually, this, this brings me to another question. So I've played a few VR games, and um, is this a VR game where you have to teleport around, or is this one of those ones where they've made it so that you're always walking, and you and you can like you're, you're walking through an endless dungeon that has been compartmentalized into your uh, VR space? You move with your controller. You can also move by walking forward. 
Uh, but the combination of the two means that you're, you're there's some times where you you know would want to move with the controller. Okay, if you're yeah, going down so, a long hallway. So this isn't one of those games where you can just only walk around and never have to use a controller to move. That's right. Okay, yeah, because that 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 I think is the most immersive way, but that requires a whole bunch of other programming and like decisions on the development side that uh introduce a lot of extra challenges yeah yeah uh you know what I think... I, i've played a few games like that and it's cool and immersive but it's it's challenging because you you need quite a large space to make it work in the first place and then it adds a lot of constraints on how the devs can make their uh levels work yeah so uh this game is definitely um it's one of my favorite horror games it's definitely, I would rank it in the same tier as my experience with Alien Isolation, uh, but even more intense than Alien Isolation, uh, it, unless you play Alien Isolation in VR, <laughs> because the immersiveness of the VR experience means that, you know, when something, it's almost like waking up in a nightmare, is what I would, is what I would explain it like, um, is, is when you, when you first start the dungeon. Uh, and everything just seems a little bit out of sorts at first if you're going in blind. And you know, then... I, you, you know, I never thought about this, but I suppose that... You know, so, so I find, even for me, like when I'm in VR for too long, you know, it, I get a bit like of a headache. Ah, uh, yes. And like, you know, sometimes I just feel a bit unsettled just because of the the physical sensation not re- being quite right. But in a horror game, I almost feel like that would help it. It would help the atmosphere. You know, the limitations of VR not feeling exactly like real life, you know, maybe contribute even more to the atmosphere of a horror game. Yeah, because the like those sensations, because you're so immersed, actually just come through as general like 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 a sense of of discomfort in in your environment too, which actually does lend to I, I would say from my experience it lends it to it exactly in that way. I'm curious, uh, have you played Amnesia? Not yet. Or or any of the Penumbra games? Uh, I've played none of the Penumbra games. Okay, so none of those ones. All right, I'm just wondering how it would compare to those because those are my favorite. I would say the most. Like, those are the scariest games I've ever played. You know what? You can try it in the studio at any time. <laughs> <laughs> we can clear a space. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and you know what? In fact, uh, I'm, I'm going to see uh, who else is interested, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll have a little Dread Halls get-together later this month. But, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm going to dive into VR, and, and I'm going to stream that. And... Spooktober VR. Spooktober DR- VR. As somebody who... Uh, can't stand scary games. I can think of no better idea than to scrap myself in so that I'm only experiencing the scary game. <laughs> <laughs> the pure terror you never asked for. Yeah, VR, VR is interesting. It's been around for in these, you know, commercial headsets for what, like four or five years now? Yeah. At least. I'd say maybe. I think even a bit more, but it was really hard to come by at first. Uh, like, the original Oculus Rift released, I almost feel like, ten years ago. <laughs> it wasn't that long but ago. But maybe, maybe I mean, it was like, Maybe, like, the original dev kits or whatever. But, yeah, it's... I, I don't have a VR headset. See, I'm, I'm again, and... And you know, you know, my girlfriend actually does some some VR testing uh, through her work through her work as a design uh, a UX designer, and so I'm probably like maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking it is longer just because she's literally working with devs of yeah. this stuff. Yeah, because their Oculus Rift was 2016, so I guess that's five years ago. Yeah, I I should mention something about uh, Dread Halls is that if if you get a kick out of reading uh, entertaining reviews, Dread Hall p- produces quite a few of them, uh, huh. because there's a lot of people who talk about experiencing this level of horror for the first time. And so, uh, yeah. Uh, there, one of my favorites is, is on the store. Um, uh, the very last paragraph, I love this. I feel my pride has taken a serious hit, and to tell you all the tr- truth, I-, I don't give a damn. There is no way I'll ever finish this game. 
and I doubt any horror games in VR will be in my future. I am now in the process of watching a lighthearted comedy or romance flick on Netflix to hopefully drift off to sleep and have a pleasant dream. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm gonna be honest, I, I didn't even finish Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Uh, I also made a point to only play that game uh, in uh, the dead of night, like 2 a.m. or later, because apparently I am a massive masochist for horror games. <laughs> uh, and yeah, some like I'd say yeah, frictional games. They make uh, they made the Penumbra games, and they made Amnesia, and they, they have another one called Soma. I think that I haven't played, that I think is also another horror game. And every single game I've played from that studio is just an exercise in terror, uh, much more so than any other game I've played or, or much more so than games from any other studio I've, I've played, I would say. Um, Ooh, uh, have you heard of this one? It's called Gorn. Gorn. I've heard of it. I haven't played it. It, it takes place in a, uh, like an, like basically an HR Geiger land. So everything has like alien ship, you know, creature aesthetics to it, but not quite because it's all, everything is made out of flesh in this universe. It is the, the flesh universe that this takes place in, and so... See, and, and you know what, though? That that on its own doesn't make a game scary. It's... Well, it depends. Like, certain people, like, not necessarily, like, terror or scarifying stuff. Like, some people just have certain things that make that unsettle them. Yeah. Like, for, for example, if you turn around the corner and uh, all of a sudden you uh, get a feeling like you're being watched and you turn around and there's just an eyeball that's open out of the wall staring at you and then it blinks closed and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> and then, yeah. Yeah. Like, yes. I, I have like that, that, that could be, depending on how it's presented, could be quite scary. Um, like, I, I haven't seen any, um, gameplay of Psychonauts 2 that got recently released because apparently the beginning parts of that game, there's a lot of there's a lot of tooth stuff. Oh yeah. And I just don't want to deal with any of that stuff. Any of that. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to see like nerves coming out of like just a mouth of gums or something like that. I don't even know if that's there, but that's what I'm expecting. And I don't want any <laughs> part of that. There's a scene in Dead Space 2 that I bet you'd totally be like, no way. And it's uh um the surgery scene and uh this guy needs something extracted out of the back of his eyeball uh with a laser and so you have to line up this laser now because it's in the dead space universe this laser is so incredibly powerful that if they miss it's going to uh um fucking kill you it's it's <laughs> like a it's like a james bond you know almost getting sawn in half laser and so uh yeah and this is just this major plot point where um, it's a giant quick time event where you have to basically uh, steer this laser into your own character's eyeball um, in, in order to prevent him from dying. Yeah. So against the threat of death, you must give yourself potentially lethal self-surgery. And yeah, it's... I, I've seen enough episodes of House where they do, they do the thing where it's like, we need a biopsy of your optic nerve. We're going to freeze your eye and then st shove this needle into it while you have to look at it. Oh. I'm just like, <laughs> I could not do that. Yeah. I, I mean, would need, I would need hard sedation <laughs> yeah. for, that, for that to go down properly. See, the funny thing is, yeah, something like that actually being done to me, I would lose my shit. But yeah, yeah in Dead Space, especially Dead Space 2, I didn't find it. I, I found Dead Space 2 to really not be scary at all. Even right. less so than the first one. <laughs> yeah, for me, I have, like, I actually, as as far as I can possibly remember, uh, I have no kind of true discernible phobias that I'm aware of yet. My, um, yeah, my, my, my psyche has not caused me to witness things um, at, that at this point in my life are still a thing. Uh, I remember when I was... Like, you know, younger, it used to be spiders, but I'm no longer afraid of spiders uh, in any way, shape, or form. Mm. Yeah, it, there's not much that I'm like, I have, I have the phobias where stuff just makes me very uncomfortable and like gives me like a shiver down my spine. I don't have anything that's just like, that terrifies me and I can't be around it. 
like uh, insect buzzing, but especially mosquito buzzing. Like I mean, that's just annoying. That I I I like get extremely unsettled at, and also the sound of like hard bristles brushing stuff, like like a like a big push broom on like a driveway or something like that. that oh. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Oddly specific. So, <laughs> I can't remember which this which uh, this this is actually accidental horror. Um, so I think it might have been Do- the 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 Doom that also had Doom VR. Um, I think that's the two games. So there's um, there's one scene basically where I I think the gravity in, in the place that you're in, in actually shifts, and so you start sliding down, mm-hmm. um, and when you're watching that on a screen, you know, that's no problem. There's an added twist, though, is that the, there's, like, some sort of giant, um, like, horrific threat coming at you from above. And so the combination of those two experiences, uh, supposedly, when you're doing that in VR, is um, quite thrilling, <laughs> to say the least. It's interesting that, uh, it's a, it, that there's that n- new ways to experience something, you know, can make, can really increase the intensity of, uh, of the way that lots of people seem to perceive it, um, myself included. Well, you're strapped into a VR headset. Mm-hmm. Nothing else is going to distract you. Now, w- what will be wild is uh, the, um, I think it's the second generation Apple uh, AR headsets, um, the ones that... Uh, uh, they have the ability to like darken the front or not, and it's it's the most lightweight. But um, it's that that one's the one that's not coming up next. But after that, there's there's some specs that have been uh, released, uh, including the design of it, which is interesting. Like what what they theorize it'll look like, uh, and it sounds really crazy. Like the ability to go into VR, uh, but also have an AR experience and have that be on something that it's essentially, you know, no clunkier than a large, you know, pair of glasses. I mean, Google Glass failed, so... Google Glass had other issues. They went, uh... I, I think they went mighty bold with, with the outward-facing camera. <laughs> Although, I think um, the HoloLens will succeed where the glass failed. Ah, uh, who knows? I think that that tech is still kind of looking for a use case to be honest like I, I don't know why i don't know where it's apart from a very few niche applications like manufacturing where i can actually where there are already people using it for their work i just don't see right now that many applications of it where it's useful enough to spend all the money on it well, that's why you you gotta think of the, the the use case. I'll break it wide open and make all the money. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> like that's the thing is that I have a feeling that a lot of the press leading up to VR was very positive on it, and as well as some of the impressions of stuff like Hololens. But those demos are given in incredibly controlled environments. I yeah. heard people that were extremely excited about VR. But when it got time for the commercial release of it, they realized, oh shit, I don't have anywhere in my house where I could cordon off enough space for this. Yeah. So yeah. I I have to move around all my furniture when I want to do VR, which is why I don't do it very much. But, I wonder if uh, like home renovation contractors ever offer that as like, you know, we can remake your room to make it, you know, a VR entertainment room well, kind of thing. It's not a matter of remaking the room. It's a matter of removing oh, the furniture. Oh, yeah, unless you have like a freaking pillar in the middle of your living room and that pillar's probably there for a reason. <laughs> well, some of it's like in, um, I, I know with Microsoft, they have the experience that's supposed to extend to the full room uh, and then they can like project you can have you can have a call between two people who are in this space which is surrounded by sensors including cameras and then it's it's like uh you know the star wars holograph basically you'll see them in your living room they'll see you in their living room it sounds very cool um for whenever that is released in the future yeah i imagine with ar stuff in particular it might make more sense for someone to 
have a room that's set up very particularly so that someone else in a different room can have their room set up in the same way so that you can then share a virtual space that also has your physical surfaces in it, like a table. You could have a table with the same location relative to the walls and then, you know, share a table in VR. I'm sure that that would be interesting uh, and potentially useful, but that would require you to have your room set up in a very particular way. So, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure there's other ways to do it, uh, but yeah. that's sort of, uh, that's a big ask unless you have a very particular uh, use case, I think. You know, I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if there comes a time when there is standard business meeting room dimensions for VR meetings and a business could literally set up their conference room to be, you know, the standard VR conference room. So you can do yeah. VR business conferences uh, that where everyone has the table in exactly the same spot uh, so that you can interact with everything in a VR environment that's also got physical objects set up the same way. Like, that would be interesting, but... Uh, yeah. I, I, I want the AR meeting that's, like, the ones in, like, the, the Marvel movies where to leave the meeting, you literally, like, turn around and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just shows you walking, walking out of, like, a little door. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of my favorites was in Westworld where they had the 3D projection of, of whoever you're talking to. And, uh, um... The, one of the characters was an artificial intelligence who had uh, escaped out of essentially a jail into the real world, right? And didn't realize that this was a uh, projection. And so she just whips out her weapon <laughs> and shoots him straight in the head, and it doesn't work, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so the next time she sees him and he does it to, to her again, she walks straight through him. <laughs> just like total power play of being like, yeah, <laughs> I'm coming for you. <laughs> But uh, the most shocking uh, scene of all out of the uh, out of out of this one was where um, uh, somebody planted a bomb in a room, and uh, the the one of the main characters was having a conversation with someone in that room right when uh, another person triggered it like a suicide bomb, and so he just sees her, and then she he sees the explosion rippling to like through her body is the last image that he sees before it cuts the feed, and he's just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, yeah. Of all of all the shows that I've watched, um, The Expanse and Westworld uh, are probably the strong strongest like hard science fiction uh, shows that I've I've seen so far. I have seen zero seconds of both of those things. <laughs> have you seen either of those, Alex? Uh, I've seen Westworld, uh, although I didn't. I think I I didn't wa I didn't finish watching season three. So, oh, they're coming out with season four. Sure, soon. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. VR. A uh, lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, some horror in VR sounds uh, very immersive, uh, and that's I think if you if you want to be scared, get scared virtually. For, for me, like, the thing I want to do in VR is pretty much just Beat Saber. Beat Saber's really good. Beat Saber is easily the game I've play, I've spent most time with in VR. Or the most anything I've spent most time with in VR. That, that's the closest thing to a killer app for me that I'm like, oh, I should get VR because of this game. Yeah. And I just haven't pulled the trigger yet because it seems like I never want to buy a headset because I feel like I should just wait for the next one. But then the next one comes out and then I'm like, I should wait for the next one. <laughs> yeah, I, I've i heard the Quest 2 is uh, better than the Quest 1. I would hope so. <laughs> because, well, the biggest difference is the latency. Mm -hmm. uh, the Quest is 90 hertz and the uh, Quest 2 is 120 hertz. Right. Ah, and yeah, okay. So, uh, full 60 any time. Yeah. So oh, what what I've heard is that the latent that latency difference actually uh, helps reduce uh, the the side effects that some people get. Yeah. So I never really got motion sickness from the little bit of VR that I tried, but I, it always made my eyes water. So I hope mm -hmm. that would, maybe that'll help it. That it's refreshing at a rate that yeah. makes my eyes not strain. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's I'm not, interesting. I'm not sure if that's. I mean, 
It's all. It, it's also the, you know anytime I've tried it, it's been passing around a headset a bunch. I don't want to spend you know five minutes trying to get it just right. So yeah, that I, I, I can I can do the thing. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, the other thing I've heard is that apparently apparently Oculus sells a, a better a better strap, which is like a lot better than the one it ships with. <laughs> Great. Uh, cool. Yeah. Accessory market going strong. I don't have. Uh, I, I, I don't have that strap, but I, I should probably get it because I've heard it's great, much more yeah. comfortable. Oh, yeah, you have it, don't you? You know what? I actually gave that to my boss because he bought the Oculus too. I you, you, wh- wh- you gave away your better strap. Why didn't you just tell him about the better strap? Because I don't have an Oculus too. Oh, they don't make the strap? Why didn't you have the strap then? So I got the, I got the strap knowing that uh, he had just got... Uh, something and i was just ah. like and, and i thought about it i was like aha i you know even though i don't need it i can put this to good use oh okay yeah yeah, yeah. oh did you buy it thinking it would work with yours um i think i didn't realize it at the time that because because that was the one that uh y- your oh with that one that i gave you yeah oh okay yeah and i i thought it would oh. work with mine um, well, I, knew, I yeah when or, i when i well when i got that box i saw that it was yeah, yeah. Uh, oculus 2 i'm like well yeah, well, yeah. And, and, but then when I saw it, I, I, and it, then I immediately thought of my boss. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll take okay. it because you know I can yeah. so the, get it to someone who would appreciate it. He, he got it for his son. So the <laughs> free like, strap just got passed around through like four people till it got to someone who could actually use it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The second hand eco- the second hand ecology, man. Thank you, Amazon. Fuck up. <laughs> that is pretty funny. Well, you know what? If you return things to Amazon, they often just destroy it. <laughs> I'm like, that's yeah. very wasteful. Or <laughs> Well that that was a case where like uh one of my relatives just like got that. They didn't order it. It just showed up at their house. <laughs> uh, along with some other stuff they ordered from Amazon. Wow. So they literally got it for free. <laughs> yeah, so someone just put it in the wrong box. Yeah. Yeah. It's have you funny. have you heard that um I, I actually so I believe it's actually true. I don't think it's like 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 a made-up story about um, a guy who traded his way up uh, through many steps from a paperclip to a house. Yeah, he made a TED Talk about that. Yeah. yeah there's there's a similar story in Magic where somebody bought a single pack of Magic cards and traded it for one of the Power 9 cards, like the most sought-after cards in the entire game, just over the course of just, like, a ton of trades. That sounds amazing. I'm in, I'm interested to see the future of VR because, like, I think that the tech, the tech's been evolving faster than I thought it would. Yeah. Because I... like, the fact that the Quest came out as a wireless headset when it did actually really shocked me that they got that far that quickly. Yeah, yeah. I I think people thought it was going to require more. Uh, miniaturization of the hardware yeah. uh, to get there. Because, like, I think the original Oculus uh, you know needed, like, three USB ports on your computer yeah. plugged in. You, you so know like, what? how the fuck did that happen? You know what it is? It's it's the mobile phone market, right? Because the Quest is basically an Android phone strapped into a screen on your face. <laughs> and the thing is that uh, the hardware in phones has actually accelerated uh, the pace of miniaturization substantially it's just that we don't realize how powerful our phones are because the software on them is just bloated so badly that my phone can't run a 2d interface smoothly right uh designed by google (laughs) right um and and, uh and so my phone can't run a simple 2d ui smoothly uh sometimes um, just because everything's so bloated. But the actual hardware in my phone is probably better than my computer now, just because my computer is a bit old. A um, bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yet, you know, I try to run, you know, stuff on my phone, and it's slow, and I'm... Like, even the browser on my phone is worse, like, uh, just because everything's so bloated. So anyway, um, the hardware is actually pretty strong on, on these... Uh, phones and that's able to be carried over into the quest and actually uh runs pretty well when all of that bloat is stripped out and the software is optimized very heavily for that specific hardware right 
No. That's a good point. And then with with the software, I feel like it's actually the software is now lagging uh, with VR rather than the hardware, I'd say. Because I'm going to be honest, um, the main thing I've actually stuck with playing more than maybe once is uh, is uh, Beat Saber. Right. Yeah. Uh, everything else I've tried in VR, I've been a little underwhelmed by. I haven't tried Half Life Alex, which probably everyone says that's great. Uh, but mo- most of the other like more longer form experiences I've tried, I've kind of fallen out with because they're just sort of samey and uh, there's it's it just becomes not actually it, like it's. I don't know. It's, there's a, there's a lot of games that feel like they're just novelties to be you know digested in 30 minutes and then never touched again yeah so yeah um like but something like beat saber that's repeatable is good or something like half-life alex which is wild to me that they finally put out a new half-life game but like less than one percent of gamers can play it <laughs> yeah i know right um yeah i i so i haven't played half-life alex but i have i did play boneworks which is actually, I believe, the engine in Boneworks was used uh, for Half Life Alex, and it was pretty good. Um, though I I found Boneworks to be, you know, again, it was kind of samey. It felt like a very much felt like a very elaborate tech demo as opposed <laughs> to an actual game. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I I'm excited to see where it goes, but. Um, I, I think right now it's it's maybe the software that's the there's just not enough. I think it's just that there isn't enough of a market in VR to make it worthwhile to spend a lot of time on a VR experience. I, I think, think I, unfortunately, I think we've gone into the catch twenty two of there wasn't enough at launch to really like slam a really big market share. Uh, so now it's like, well, why would I develop a VR game? There's not enough people with headsets. And then on the consumer side, why should I buy a headset? There's not enough software on VR, like me. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, because the actual, like the Quest isn't that expensive. It's uh in fact I think it's cheaper than uh, the major console releases now. I think they 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 were they're developing some some bigger games on there. I think it was either Call of Duty or Battlefield uh, that that uh, they announced for VR, and then they had a trailer for it, and it looked dope. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's just uh, it's just you know waiting for the software to mature, and it's gonna take some time. Well, if if any uh, of our intrepid listeners have recommendations for VR games that you know work on a quest they can you can give us a shout uh, send those to angry sunzone at outlook.com or DM us on Twitter at angry sunzone if you want to get in touch yeah and uh, also uh, if you're interested in uh, seeing more of us uh, literally and metaphorically uh, you can check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got videos on gaming, uh, cookies. We've we've ranked some cookies uh, recently, so uh, check out our YouTube channel for uh, some fun times. Yeah, and uh, shout out to Matthew, who uh, made a uh, awesome. I'll I'll call it in the spirit of a response uh, with a uh, Kit Kat a video of his own trying exotic Kit Kats like. I believe a wasabi Kit Kat. Oh, that sounds awful. Well, you all have to watch the video to find out. <laughs> <laughs> sounds spicy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyways, our YouTube channel is uh, definitely got a lot of uh, fun content on there, and uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Till next time. Stay spooky.